We have a lot of visitors here tonight. I want to welcome you. Thank you for coming and sharing some time with us. Um, this church has uh, transformed me. Um, I have uh, chosen for my starting point tonight a passage, a story from the book of Joshua in the Old Testament. Up to this point, the Israelites have been taken out of Egypt, they've crossed the desert with Moses, and they've entered into the promised land with Joshua. Now, Joshua was an incredible leader. I gotta tell you, I can't think of him without thinking about Hugh Jackman. So put that image in your mind. <laughs> You know, Joshua is most famously known for marching the Israelite army around the walled city of Jericho. For six days, he had the army walk in silence. On the seventh day, he said, shout, blow the trumpets. And the walls of Jericho came tumbling down without any military action. Another story that I really love from Joshua is there was a time when he was fighting his enemies and he needed more, he prayed to God. He said, I need more time to defeat these guys. And the story says, the sun stood still in the middle of the sky. Joshua finished the battle, and then the sun set. Uh, his approval rating remained very high throughout his career. <laughs> so here we are at the end of Joshua. Joshua gathers his people. They're on a plateau overlooking Canaan, the land God promised Abraham hundreds of years earlier. The nation is about to split off. They're, each family has got their own plot of land. They're about to split off into the promised land and live forever in peace and prosperity. Joshua stands before this huge crowd. Imagine Obama's view on Inauguration Day. And he raises his hands and he says, People of Israel, we have a choice. Which God are you going to serve? We can look backwards and worship the pagan gods from long ago. We can look to the side and worship the gods of our neighbors and just sort of blend in? Or we can choose to, to, to worship the God that brought us right to this place, right to this moment, Jehovah. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, in those days when a man said my house, he meant him, his wives, his children, his servants, his flocks, his tents, everything that he owned. And by the way, you shouldn't think of Joshua declaring um, when he serves God that he's going to become a lowly servant of God. It's important to think of it as they're promising to live their lives, even their fabulous lives, with God's priorities above their own. So Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I picked this passage because of that phrase, my house. See, my house means something very different to me than it did even 18 months ago. At the end of this month, the bank is going to put new locks on my house and confiscate everything I have inside. My house is in foreclosure. Five years ago, I had a terrific television job and I bought a huge house that I could afford. Then I borrowed against it and bought more properties. A lot of people did that. Then I lost my job. Then the housing market tanked. The extra stuff which I had accumulated, I always thought I could sell on a rainy day. But it turns out nobody's got expendable income anymore. Then my partner of 12 years and I broke up. Almost everything that I had considered a gift from God had been taken away. Now, I'm not going to plead poverty. I know that I have more opportunities. I have more stuff still than most people on the planet. But I have to tell you, the word homeless means something different to me. Debtor's prison means something different to me. Now, I've always believed as a Christian, there should be a different way to look at the world. If our faith doesn't inform every day, how are we different than anybody else? So on the first day of Lent, Ash Wednesday, I go to a morning service, and the priest reads a psalm that starts something like, Oh, Lord, the evil ones are succeeding. The wicked are doing better than me. And I think, this is why I go to church. The psalmist totally gets the way that I'm suffering. <laughs> and then the psalm continues. But you, Lord God, will be victorious. And the first thing that came to mind was, I doubt it. Oh. It's the first day of Lent, and I doubt that God is interested in taking care of my life. I deeply doubt it. 
I guess I'm a bad Christian because I think in crisis you're supposed to say, I'm not worried about anything. I give it over to God. But, you know, I realize that attitude is the one that makes me angry. I'm not going to worry about it seems irresponsible, uh, unhuman. Of course I'm worried. I have grief. I have angst. I have uh, bankruptcy lawyer's number programmed into my cell phone. I am worried. Now, Martin Luther tells a wonderful story that at the beginning of his career as a monk, he realized he didn't love God. He hated God for judging us. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, was able to preach God's love and grace to everyone. But it wasn't for years until he realized he didn't think God's grace applied to him. You know, it was in those moments where those men said, I doubt God, that they were able to clearly see where they stood with the Lord. So here I am on the first day of Lent, and I realize I have doubt as well. And so I admit it to God and to myself. What am I going to do? I doubt you. And then a promise that Jesus gave to his disciples, which includes us, came to me. I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Well, I, I got to admit an age has ended in my life. I think we have to agree an age has ended in America, in the global economy. This time of Joshua, this time of victory and excess is over. Now, when a person needs to go in for surgery, when a child has to go confess to his neighbor that he's broken a window, when a felon is about to receive his sentencing, they will often ask, will you go with me? Many people are willing to accept their fate, to take their lumps, to pay the consequences of their actions, as long as they don't have to go alone. See, I think Jesus knew this about us, and that's why he made that promise. I will be with you always. Now, I don't know what that's going to look like for me. I don't know what that's going to look like for you. It's going to be different for each of us. You know, that's the beauty of a relationship with God. God meets us in all of our own ways. You know, I realize God doesn't just bless us by pouring blessings upon us. Think about the wealthiest men in the Bible, Abraham, David, Solomon. When did they know they were blessed by God? When they were counting their flocks, when they were defeating their enemies, when they were building temples. No, those people knew that they were blessed by God when they got to talk to God one on one. One God, one man, one woman. As Eugene Peterson has written, it is a wonder God speaks to us. It is no less of a wonder that God listens to us. This wonder is part of being blessed by God. And I have to confess the extra stuff in my life got in the way of my wonder. Now, the most uncomfortable part of this time for me is I don't know what the future holds. Obviously, the truth is I never knew. But I think I was blinded from all of that by the false assurances of my wealth, of my earning potential, of my job. Now, you're never going to hear me say, oh, thank God I lost everything. I mean, come on. It was awful. <laughs> It was, it, it's, it, you know, it's still a bad time for many of us. I mean, I don't have to tell you. We don't know what our bank accounts are going to hold. We don't know if we can afford health care or tuition or retirement. We don't know if our church doors can stay open. Now, wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if God simply blessed us and nothing bad ever happened and we could serve God in our abundance? But let's be honest, that doesn't feel responsible. That doesn't feel human. You know, I think it's more human if we can say, you know, today, as for me and my house, my uncertainty, my tuition, my relationships, my foreclosure, my loans, my hopes, my dreams, insert every good and bad thing here. Let me bring it all to serve the Lord. Let me bring it all to live my life with God's priorities ahead of mine. See, now that has some teeth to it. That has some credibility. You know, now it feels human. Because Jesus has said, I will be with you only, always. Now it feels real. Amen. <laughs>